are welcome to your country, dear ah, Antonio. Delia. You have long been in France, mm. and you return a very formal Frenchman in your habit. <laughs> How do you like the French court? I admire it. In seeking to reduce both state and people to a fixed order, the judicious king begins at home. Quits first his royal palace of flattering sycophants, of dissolute and infamous persons, which he sweetly terms his master's masterpiece, work of heaven. And what is it makes this blessed government but a most provident council, who dare freely inform him the corruption of the times? Though some of the court hold it presumption to instruct princes what they ought to do, it is a noble duty to inform them what they ought to foresee. Here comes Bossola, the only court gall. Yet I observe his railing is not for simple love of piety. Indeed, he rails at those things which he wants, would be as lecherous, covetous, or proud, bloody, or envious as any man, if he had means to be so. Uh, I knew him in Padua, a fantastical scholar. He hath studied himself half blear-eyed to gain the name of a speculative man. I knew him seven years in the galleys for a notorious murder, and was thought the cardinal suborned it. It is great pity he should be thus neglected. I heard he's very valiant. This foul melancholy will poison all his goodness, for I'll tell you. If too immoderate sleep be truly said to be an inward rust unto the soul, it then doth follow want of action breeds all black malcontents, and their close rearing, like moths in cloth, do hurt for want of wearing. Is the cardinal let us withdraw? Bossola. I do haunt you still. So. I've done you better service than to be slighted thus. Miserable age, were only the reward of doing well as the doing of it. You enforce your merit too much. I fell into the galleys in your service, where I wore two towels instead of a shirt with a knot on the shoulder after the fashion of a Roman mantle. <sighs> slighted thus. I will thrive some way. Blackbirds fatten best in hard weather, why not I in these dog days? Would you could become honest. With all your divinity, do but direct me the way to it. I've known many travel far for it, and yet return as arrant knaves as they went forth, because they carried themselves always along with them. Are you gone? <sighs> some fellows, they say, are possessed with the devil. But this great fellow were able to possess the greatest devil and make him worse. He hath denied thee some suit. Oh. He and his brother are like plum trees that grow crooked over standing pools. They are rich and er laden with fruit, but none but crows, pies, and caterpillars feed on them. Could I be one of their flattering panders, I would hang on their ears like a horse leech till I were full and then drop off. Who would rely upon these miserable dependencies in expectation to be advanced tomorrow? What creature ever fed worse than hoping Tantalus? Nor ever died any man more fearfully than he that hoped for a pardon. There are rewards for hawks and dogs when they've done a service, but for a soldier that hazards his limbs in a battle, nothing but a kind of geometry is his last supportation. Geometry? Aye, to hang in a fair pair of slings, take his latter swing in the world upon an honourable pair of crutches, from hospital to hospital. Very <laughs> well, sir. And yet do not you scorn us. The places in the court are but like beds in the hospital. Well, this man's head lies at that man's foot, and so lower and lower. Antonio, here comes the Duke. Will you promise to make me the partaker of the natures of some of your great courtiers? Ah, oh, Delio, I shall. Rodrigo, who took the ring oftenest? Antonio Bologna, my Lord Ferdinand. Our sister Duchess's great master of her household. Give him the jewel. You are a good horseman, Antonio. You have excellent riders in France. What do you think of good horsemanship? Nobly, my lord. As out of the Grecian horse issued many famous princes, so out of brave horsemanship arise the first sparks of growing resolution that raise the mind to noble action. You bespoke it worthily. Your brother, the Lord Cardinal, and Sister Duchess. Now, Antonio, your promise. What's that Cardinal? I mean his temper. They say he's a brave fellow. Will play his 5,000 crowns at tennis dance, court ladies, and one that hath fought single combat. Some such flashes superficially hang on him for form, but observe his inward character. He is a melancholy churchman. 
The spring in his face is nothing but the engendering of toads. Where he is jealous of any man, he lays worse plots for them than ever was imposed on Hercules. For he strews in his way flatterers, panders, intelligences, atheists, and a thousand such political monsters. How galleys come about? They are, my lord. He should have been Pope. But instead of coming to it by the primitive decency of the church, he did bestow bribes so largely and so impudently as if he would carry it away without heaven's knowledge. They that do flatter him most say oracles hang at his lips, and verily I believe them, for the devil speaks in them. <sighs> Some good he hath done. You have given too much of him. What's his brother? The duke there. <laughs> most perverse and turbulent nature. What appears in him mirth is merely outside. If he laugh heartily, it is to laugh all honesty out of fashion. Twins? In quality. He speaks with others' tongues and hears men's suits with others' ears. Or seem to sleep at the bench only to entrap offenders in their answers. Dooms men to death by information, rewards by hearsay. And the law to him is like a foul black cobweb to a spider. He makes it his dwelling and a prison to entangle those shall feed him. Mm, most true. Here's the Lord Grisselan is come to take his leave. He never pays debts unless they be shrewd terms, and those he will confess that he doth owe. Bring the parochies. We'll bring you down to the haven. But for their sister, the right noble duchess, you never fixed your eye on three fair medals cast in one figure of so different temper. For her discourse... It is so full of rapture, you only will begin then to be sorry when she doth end her speech, and wish, in wonder, she held it less vain glory to talk much than your penance to hear her. And whilst she speaks, oh, she throws upon a man so sweet a look that it were able to raise one to a galliard that lay in a dead palsy, and to dote on that sweet countenance. But... In that look, there speaketh so divine a countenance as cuts off all lascivious and vain hope. Her days are practised in such noble virtue that sure her nights, nay more, her very sleeps, are more in heaven than other ladies' shrifts. Let all sweet ladies break their flattering glasses and dress themselves in her. <laughs> Fie, Antonio. You play the wire drawer with her commendations. I'll case the picture up only thus much. All her particular worth grows to this sum. She stains the time past, lights the time to come. You must attend my lady in the gallery some half an hour hence. I shall. Come, Delio. Sister, I have a suit to you. To me, sir? A gentleman here. Daniel de Bossola, one that was in the galleys. Yes, I know him. A worthy fellow he is. Pray, let me entreat for the provisorship of your horse. Your knowledge of him commends him and prefers him. We are now upon parting. Good Lord Grisselan, do us commend to all our noble friends at the Liga. Sir, I shall. Brother Cardinal. We are alone, my lord. Be sure you entertain that bossola for your intelligence. I would not be seen it, and therefore many times I have slighted him when he did court our furtherance as this morning. Antonio, the great master of our household, had been far fitter. You are deceived in him. His nature is too honest for such business. He comes. I'll leave you. I was lured to you. My brother here, the cardinal, could never abide you. Never since he was in my debt. Maybe some oblique character in your face made him suspect you. Doth he study physiognomy? There's no more credit to be given to the face than to a sick man's urine, which some call the physician's whore because she cousins him. He did suspect me wrongfully. For that he must give great men leave to take their times. Distrust doth causes seldom be deceived. You see, the oft shaking of the cedar tree fastens it more at root. Yet take heed, for to suspect a friend unworthily instructs him the next way to suspect you and prompts him to deceive you. <laughs> There's gold. Sir, what follows? 
Never rained such showers as these without thunderbolts at the tail of them. Whose throat must I cut? <laughs> Your inclination to shed blood rides post before my occasion to use you. I give you that. To live in the court here and observe the Duchess. To note all the particulars of her behaviour. What suitors do solicit her for marriage and whom she best affects. She's a young widow. I would not have her marry again. No, sir. Do not you ask the reason, but be satisfied. I say I would not. It seems you would create me one of your familiars. Familiar? What's that? Why, a very quaint, invisible devil in flesh. An intelligent, sir. <laughs> Such a kind of thriving thing I would wish thee. And ere long thou mayst arrive at a higher place by it. Take your devils, which hell calls angels. These cursed gifts would make you a corrupter, me an impudent traitor. And should I take these, they take me to hell. Sir, I'll take nothing from you that I have given. There is a place that I procured for you this morning. The provisorship of the horse. Have you heard on't? No. Tis yours. Is it not worth thanks? I would have you curse yourself now that your bounty, which makes men truly noble, there should make me a villain. Oh, to avoid ingratitude for the good deed you have done me, I must do all the ill man can invent. Thus the devil candies all sins o'er, and what heaven terms vile, that names he complimental. Be yourself. Keep your old garb of melancholy. T'will express you envy those that stand above your reach, yet strive not to come near em. This will gain access to private lodgings, where yourself may, like a politic dormouse, as I have seen some feed in a lord's dish, half asleep, not seeming to listen to any talk, and yet these rogues have cut his throat in a dream. What's my place? The provisorship of the horse. So then my corruption grew out of horse dung. I am your creature. Away! <sighs> Let good men for good deeds covet good fame, since place and riches offer bribes of shame. Sometimes the devil doth preach. Sister, we are to part from you, and your own discretion must now be your director. You are a widow! You know already what man is, and therefore let not youth, high promotion, eloquence... No, nor anything without the addition honour sway your high blood. Marry, they are most luxurious, will wed twice. Oh, fine. Their livers are more spotted than Laban's sheep. Diamonds are of most value, they say, that have passed through most jewellers' hands. Whores, by that rule, are precious. <laughs> will you hear me? I'll never marry. So most widows say. But commonly that motion lasts no longer than the turning of an hourglass. The funeral sermon and it end both together. Now hear me. You live in a rank pasture here at the court. There is a kind of honey dew that's deadly to will poison your fame. Look to it. Be not cunning, for they whose faces do belie their hearts are witches ere they arrive at twenty years. Aye, and give the devil suck. This is terrible good counsel. Hypocrisy is woven of a fine, small thread, subtler than Vulcan's engine, yet believe it. Your darkest actions, nay, your private thoughts will come to light. You may flatter yourself and take your own choice, privately be married under the eaves of night. Think it the best voyage you ever made, like the irregular crab, which though it goes backward thinks that it goes right because it goes its own way, but observe... Such weddings may more properly be said to be executed than celebrated. The marriage night is the entrance into some prison. And those joys, those lustful pleasures, are like heavy sleeps which do forerun man's mischief. Very well. Wisdom begins at the end. Remember it! I think this speech between you both was studied. It came so roundly off. You are my sister. 
This was my father's poniard. Do you see? I'd be loath to see it look rusty, cause twas his. I would have you give o'er these chargeable revels. A visor and a mask are whispering rooms that were never built for goodness. Fare you well. And women like that part which, like the lamprey, hath ne'er a bone in it. Visor! Nay! I mean the tongue. Variety of courtship. What cannot a neat knave with a smooth tail make a woman believe? Farewell, lusty widow. Shall this move me? <laughs> if all my royal kindred lay in my way unto this marriage, I'd make them my low footsteps. And even now, even in this hate, as men in some great battles by apprehending danger have achieved almost impossible actions, I have heard soldiers say so. So I, through frights and threatenings, will essay this dangerous venture. Let old wise report I winked and chose a husband. Cariola! To thy known secrecy I have given up more than my life, my fame. Both shall be safe, for I'll conceal this secret from the world as warily as those that trade in poison keep poison from their children. <laughs> Thy protestation is ingenious and hearty, <laughs> I believe it. Is Antonio come? He attends you. Good dear soul, leave me, but place thyself behind the arras, where thou mayest overhear us. Wish me good speed, for I am going into a wilderness where I shall find nor path nor friendly clue to be my guide. <laughs> I sent for you. Sit down. Take pen and ink and write. Are you ready? Yes. What did I say? <laughs> that I should write somewhat. <laughs> I remember. After these triumphs and this large expense, it's fit, like thrifty husbands, we inquire what's laid up for tomorrow. So please, your beauteous excellence. Beauteous, indeed, I thank you. I look young for your sake. <laughs> you attain my cares upon you. I'll fetch your grace the particulars of your revenue and expense. Oh, you are an upright treasurer. But you mistook. For when I said I meant to make inquiry what's laid up for tomorrow, I did mean what's laid up yonder for me. Where? In heaven. I am making my will, as tis fit princes should in perfect memory. And I pray, sir, tell me, were not one better make it smiling thus than in deep groans and terrible ghastly looks, as if the gifts we parted with procured that violent distraction? Oh, much better. If I had a husband now, this care were quit. But I intend to make you overseer. What good deed shall we first remember? Say? Begin with that first good deed began in the world after man's creation. The sacrament of marriage. <laughs> I'd have you first provide for a good husband. Give him all. All? Yes. Your excellent self. In a winding sheet? <laughs> in a couple? St. <gasps> Winifred! That were a strange will. For a stranger, if there were no will in you to marry again. What do you think of marriage? I take it as those that denied purgatory. It locally contains or heaven or hell. There's no third place in it. How do you affect it? My banishment feeding my melancholy would often reason thus. Pray, let's hear it. Say a man never marry, nor have children. What takes that from him? Only the bare name of being a father, or the weak delight to see the little wanton ride a cockhorse upon a painted stick, <laughs> or hear him chatter like a taut star. <laughs> fie, fie, what's all this? One of your eyes is bloodshot. Use my ring to it. They say it is very sovereign. Twas my wedding ring. And I did vow never to part with it, 
but to my second husband. You have parted with it now? Yes, to help your eyesight. You have made me stark blind. How? There is a saucy and ambitious devil is dancing in this circle. Remove him. How? There needs small conjuration when your finger may do it thus. Is it fit? What said you? Sir, this goodly roof of yours is too low built. I cannot stand upright in it, nor discourse, without I raise it higher. Raise yourself, or if you please, my hand to help you, so. <sighs> Ambition, madam, is a great man's madness that is not kept in chains and close pent rooms, but in fair, lightsome lodgings, and is girt with the wild noise of prattling visitants, which makes it lunatic beyond all cure. Conceive not I am so stupid, but I aim where to your favours tent. But he's a fool that, being a cold, would thrust his hands i the fire to warm them. So, now the ground's broke. You may discover what a wealthy mine I make you lord of. Oh, my unworthiness. You were ill to sell yourself. This darkling of your worth is not like that which tradesmen use in the city. Their false lights are to rid bad wares off. And I must tell you, if you will know where breathes a complete man, I speak it without flattery. Turn your eyes and progress through yourself. Whether nor heaven nor hell, I should be honest. I have long served virtue, and ne'er tain wages of her. Now she pays it! <laughs> the misery of us that are born great! We are forced to woo, because none dare woo us. And as a tyrant doubles with his words and fearfully equivocates, so we are forced to express our violent passions in riddles and in dreams, and leave the path of simple virtue, which was never made to seem the thing it is not. Go! Go brag, you have left me heartless. Oh. Mine is in your bosom. I hope t'will multiply love there. Oh. You do tremble. Make not your heart so dead a piece of flesh to fear more than to love me. Sir, be confident. Uh -huh. What is distracts you? This is flesh and blood, sir. It is not the figure cut in alabaster kneels at my husband's tomb. Awake! Awake, man! I do here put off all vain ceremony and only do appear to you a young widow that claims you for her husband. And like a widow, I use but half a blush in Truth speak for me. I will remain the constant sanctuary of your good name. I thank you, gentle love. And cause you shall not come to me in debt, being now my steward, here upon your lips I sign your quietus est. This you should have begged now. I have seen children off to eat sweetmeats thus, as fearful to devour them too soon. <laughs> For your brothers. Do not think of them. All discord without this circumference is only to be pitied and not feared. Yet should they know it, time will easily scatter the tempest. <sighs> These words should be mine, and all the parts you have spoke, if some part of it would not have savoured flattery. Kneel. Huh? <laughs> this woman's of my counsel. <laughs> I have heard lawyers say a contract in a chamber, per verba de presenti, is absolute marriage. Come, kneel. Bless heaven, this sacred Gordian which let violence never untwine. And may our sweet affections, like the spheres, be still in motion. Quickening and make the like soft music that we may imitate the loving palms best emblem of a peaceful marriage that never bore fruit divided what can the church force more that fortune 
may not know an accident either of joy or sorrow to divide our fixed wishes. How can the church pine faster? We now are man and wife. <laughs> and tis the church that must but echo this. Maid, mm. stand apart. I now am blind. What's your conceit in this? I would have you lead your fortune by the hand unto your marriage bed. You speak in me this, for we now are one. <laughs> we'll only lie and talk together and plot to appease my humorous kindred. <laughs> and if you please, like the old tale in Alexander and Lodowick, lay a naked sword between us, <laughs> keep us chaste. <laughs> oh, let me shroud my blushes in your bosom, <laughs> since tis the treasury of all my secrets. Oh. Mm. Whether the spirit of greatness or of woman reign most in her, I know not. But it shows a fearful madness. I owe her much of pity. I observe our Duchess is sick a days. She pukes, her stomach seethes. The fins of her eyelids look most teeming blue. She wanes o' the cheek and waxes fat i' the flank, and contrary to our Italian fashion, wears a loose-bodied gown. There's somewhat hint. I have a trick may chance discover it, a pretty one. I've bought some apricocks, the first our spring yields. Antonio. And so long since married, you amaze me. Let me seal your lips for ever. For did I think that anything but the air could carry these words from you, I should wish you had no breath at all. Ah, oh, now, sir, in your contemplation, you are studying to become a great wise fellow. Huh. Sir, the opinion of wisdom is a foul tetter that runs all over a man's body. If simplicity directs us to have no evil, it directs us to a happy being. For the subtlest folly proceeds from the subtlest wisdom. Let me be simply honest. Mm, I do understand your inside. Do you, sir? Because you would not seem to appear to the world puffed up with your preferment, you continue this out-of-fashion melancholy. Leave it. Leave it. Give me leave to be honest in any phrase, in any compliment whatsoever. Shall I confess myself to you? I look no higher than I can reach. They are the gods that must ride on winged horses. A lawyer's mule of a slow pace will both suit my disposition and business, for mark me, when a man's mind rides faster than his horse can gallop, they quickly both tire. Mm, you would look up to heaven, but I think the devil that rules the air stands in your light. Oh, sir, you are lord of the ascendant, chief man with the duchess. A duke was your cousin German removed. Say you were lineally descended from King Pepin, or he himself, what of this? Search the heads of the greatest rivers in the world, you shall find them but bubbles of water. Some would think the souls of princes were brought forth by some more weighty cause than those of meaner persons. Well, they're deceived. There's the same hand to them, the like passions sway them, the same reason that makes a vicar go to law for a tithe pig and undo his neighbours makes them spoil a whole province and batter down goodly cities with the cannon. Your arm, Antonio. Do I not grow fat? I'm exceeding short-winded. Bossola, uh. I would have you, sir, provide for me a litter, such a one as the Duchess of Florence rode in. The Duchess used one when she was great with child. I think she did. Come, hither, mend my ruff, here. When? Thou art such a tedious lady, and thy breath smells of lemon pills. What thou hadst done? Shall I swoon under thy fingers? I am so troubled with the mother. I fear too much. I have a present for your grace. For me, sir? Apricocks, madam. <gasps> oh, 
Oh, sir, where are they? I have heard of none to year. Good, her colour rises. Indeed, I thank you. They're wondrous fair ones. Mmm. What an unskilful fellow is our gardener. We should have none this month. Will not your grace pair them? No. They taste of musk, methinks. When do they do? Uh, I know not, yet I wish your grace had paired them. Why? I forgot to tell you, the knave gardener, only to raise his profit by them the sooner, did ripen them in horse dung. <laughs> oh, you jest! <laughs> you shall judge. Pray, taste one. Uh, indeed, madam, I, I do not love the fruit. Sir, you are loath to rob us of our dainties. Tis a delicate fruit. They say they are restorative. Tis a pretty art, this grafting. Tis so, a bettering of nature. To make a pippin grow upon a crab, a damson on a blackthorn. How greedily she eats them. A whirlwind strike off these bored farthingales. For but for that and the loose-bodied gown, I should have discovered apparently the young springhall cutting a caper in her belly. I thank you, Bothola. They were right good ones. If they do not make me sick. Oh now, madam. This green fruit and my stomach are not friends. <gasps> How they swell me. No, you are too much swelled already. <sighs> I am in an extreme cold sweat. <laughs> I am very sorry. Lights to my chamber. Oh, good Antonia. I fear I am undone. Lights there. Lights. Oh, my most trusty Delia, we are lost. I fear she's fallen in labour, and there's left no time for her remove. Have you prepared those ladies to attend her and procured that politic safe conveyance for the midwife your duchess plotted? I have. Make use, then, of this forced occasion. Give out that Bossela hath poisoned her with these apricots. That will give some colour for her keeping close. Fie, fie, the physicians will then flock to her. Well, for that, you may pretend she'll use some prepared antidote of her own lest the physicians should re-poison her. Oh, I am lost in amazement. I know not what to think on. Oi. <laughs> so, there's no question but her tetchiness and most vulturous eating of the apricocks are apparent signs of breeding now. I am in haste, sir. <sighs> Shut up the court gates! Why, sir? What's the danger? Shut up the postons presently and call all the officers of the court. I shall instantly. Who keeps the key of the park gate? For the Bosco. Let him bring it presently. Oh, gentlemen of the court! The foul is treason! Oh. These apricots should be poisoned now without my knowledge. Are all the officers here? We are. Uh -huh. Gentlemen. We have lost much plate, you know, and but this evening jewels to the value of four thousand ducats are missing in the Duchess cabinet. Now, are the gates shut? Yes. It is the Duchess' pleasure each officer be locked into his chamber till the sun rising, and to send the keys of all their chests and of their outward doors into her bedchamber. She's very sick. At her pleasure. She entreats you take it not ill. The innocent shall be the more approved by it. Fare thee well. Oh, come. How fares it with the Duchess? She's exposed unto the worst of torture, pain, and fear. Speak to her all happy comfort. Oh, how I do play the fool with mine own danger. You are this night, dear friend, to post to Rome. My life lies in your service. Do not doubt me. Oh, tis far from me. And yet fear presents me somewhat that looks like danger. Believe it. Tis but the shadow of your fear, no more. How superstitiously we mind our evils. The throwing down salt, or crossing of a hair, Bleeding at nose, the stumbling of a horse, or singing of a cricket are of power to daunt whole man in us. Sir, fare you well. I wish you all the joys of a blessed father, and for my faith, lay this under your breast. Old friends, like old swords, still our trusted best. Sir, you are the happy father of a son. Your wife commends him to oh, you. Blessed comfort. For heaven's sake, tend her well. I'll presently go set a figure for his nativity. Sure, I did hear a woman shriek, list her. And the sound came, if I received it right, from the Duchess lodgings. There's some stratagem in the confining all our courtiers to their several wards. I must have part of it. My intelligence will freeze else. List again. 
Maybe it was the melancholy bird, best friend of silence and solitariness, the owl that screamed so. Ah, Antonio. I heard some noise. Who's there? What art thou? Speak! Antonio, put not your face nor body to such a forced expression of fear. I am Bossola, your friend. Bossola? This mould does undermine me. Had you not a noise even now? From whence? From the Duchess' lodgings. Not I, did you? I did, or else I dreamt. Let's walk towards it. No. If maybe twas but the rising of the wind. Huh. Very likely. Methinks it is very cold, and yet you sweat. Hmm? You look wildly. <sighs> What's that to you? It is rather to be questioned what design, when all men were commanded to their lodgings, makes you a night walker. In sooth, I'll tell you. Now all the courts asleep, I thought the devil had least to do here. I came to say my prayers. And if it do offend you, I do so. You are a fine courtier. This fellow will undo me. You gave the Duchess apricots today. Pray heaven they were not poisoned. Poisoned? A Spanish fig for the imputation. Oh, traitors are ever confident till they are discovered. There were jewels stolen, too. In my conceit, none are to be suspected more than yourself. You are a false steward. Saucy slave. I'll pull thee up by the roots. Maybe the ruin will crush you to pieces. You are an impudent snake indeed, sir. Are you scarce warm, and do you show your sting? Oh, you libel well, sir. No, sir. Copy it out, and I will set my hand to it. My nose bleeds. One that was superstitious would count this ominous when it merely comes by chance. Two letters that are wrought here for my name upon my kerchief, drowned in blood. <laughs> Mere accident. For you, sir, I'll take order. In the morn, you shall be safe. Ah. It is that must colour her lying in. Sir, this door you pass not. I do not hold it fit that you come near the Duchess' lodgings till you have quit yourself. The greater like the base, now they are the same, when they seek shameful ways to avoid shame. Antonio, you're about to drop a paper. Ah, here it is. What's here? A child's nativity calculated. The Duchess was delivered of a son between the hours of twelve and one in the night, Anno Dom 1504. That's this year. Decimo nono decembris, that's this night. Taken according to the meridian of Malfi. That's our Duchess. Happy discovery. Now it is most apparent. This precise fellow is the Duchess board. I have it to my wish. This is a parcel of intelligency our courtiers were cased up for. It needs must follow that I must be committed on pretense of poisoning her, which I'll endure and laugh at. If one could find the father now. But that time will discover. Old Castruccio in the morning posts to Rome. By him I'll send a letter that shall make her brother's galls overflow their livers. This night, digged up a mandrake, See you. and I'm grown mad with it. What's the prodigy? We there, a sister damned. She's loose in the hilts, grown a notorious trumpet. Speak lower. Lower! Rogues do not whisper it now, but seek to publish it. As servants do the bounty of their lords, aloud, and with a covetous searching eye to mark who note them. Ah! Oh! Confusion seize her! She hath had most cunning boards to serve her turn, and more secure conveyances for lust than towns of garrison for service. Is it possible? Can this be certain? Rhubarb. Oh, for rhubarb to purge this collar. Here's the cursed day to prompt my memory, and here at your stick, till of her bleeding heart I make a sponge to wipe it out. Why do you make yourself so wild a tempest? Would I could be one, that I might toss her palace about her ears, root up her goodly forests, blast her meads, and lay her general territory as waste as she hath done her honours. Shall our blood, the royal blood of Aragon and Castile, be thus attainted? <laughs> Apply desperate physic. We 
must not now use balsamum, but fire, the smarting cupping glass, for that's the mean to purge infected blood, such blood as hers. <laughs> there is a kind of pity in mine eye. I'll give it to my handkerchief, and now tis here. I'll bequeath this to her bastard. What to do? Why, to make soft lint for his mother's wounds, when I have hewed her to pieces. Cursed creature. Unequal nature to place women's hearts so far upon the left side. Ha, foolish men, that e'er will trust their honour in a bark made of so slight, weak bulrush as his woman, apt every minute to sink it. Thus ignorance, when it hath purchased honour, it cannot wield it. <laughs> Methinks I see her laughing. Excellent hyena! Talk to me somewhat quickly, or my imagination will carry me to see her in the shameful act of sin. With who? Happily, with some strong thighed bargeman, or one of the woodyard that can coit the sledge, or toss the bar, yeah. or else some lovely squire that carries coals up to her privy lodging. You sly beyond your reason. Go to, mistress! "'Tis not your whore's milk that shall quench my wild fire, but your whore's blood!' "'How idly shows this rage, which carries you as men conveyed by witches through the air on violent whirlwinds! "'This intemperate noise fitly resembles deaf men's shrill discourse, who talk aloud, thinking all other men to have their imperfection. "'Have not you my palsy?' "'Yes, but I can be angry without this rupture.' There is not in nature a thing that makes man so deformed, so beastly, as doth intemperate anger. Ugh. Chide yourself. You have divers men who never yet express their strong desire of rest, but by unrest, by vexing of themselves. Come, put yourself in tune. So I will only study to seem the thing I am not. I could kill her now, in you, or in myself, for I do think it is some sin in us. Heaven doth revenge by her. Are you stark mad? I would have their bodies burnt in a coal pit with the vintage stopped, that their cursed smoke might not ascend to heaven, or dip the sheets they lie in in pitch or sulphur, wrap them in it, and then light them like a match, or else to boil their bastard to a callus and give it his lecherous father to renew the sin of his back. I'll leave you. Nay, I have done. <sighs> I am confident. Had I been damned in hell and should have heard of this, it would have put me into a cold sweat. <laughs> in, in, I'll go sleep. Till I know who leaps my sister, I'll not stir. That known... I'll find scorpions to string my whips and fix her in a general eclipse. Our noble friend, my most beloved Delio. Oh, you've been a stranger long at court. Came you along with Lord Ferdinand? I did, sir. Mm. And how fares your noble duchess? Oh, right, fortunately well. She's an excellent feeder of pedigrees. <laughs> Since you last saw her, she hath had two children more. Well. A son and daughter. <laughs> Methinks twas yesterday. <sighs> Let me but wink and not behold your face, which to mine eye is somewhat leaner. Mm. Verily, I should dream it were within this half hour. You have not been in law, friend Delia. <laughs> nor in prison, nor a suitor at the court nor begged the reversion of some great man's place, nor troubled with an old wife, <laughs> which doth make your time so insensibly hasten. Pray, sir, tell me, hath not this news arrived yet to the ear of the Lord Cardinal? I fear it hath. The Lord Ferdinand, that's newly come to court, doth bear himself right dangerously. Pray, why? He is so quiet that he seems to sleep the tempest out as dormice do in winter. Those houses that are haunted are most still till the devil be up. Mm, what say the common people? The common rabble do directly say she's a strumpet. And your graver heads, which would be politic, what censure they? They do observe I grow to infinite purchase, the left-hand way. And all suppose the Duchess would amend it if she could. Mm. For, say they, Great princes, though they grudge their officers, should have such large and unconfined means to get wealth under them, will not complain, lest thereby they should make them odious unto the people. 
for other obligation of love or marriage between her and me, they never dream of. The Lord Ferdinand is going to bed. I'll instantly the better, for I am weary. I am to bespeak a husband for you. For me, sir? Pray, who is? The great Count Malatesti. Fie upon him. A count? He's a mere stick of sugar candy. You may look quite through him. When I choose a husband, I will marry for your honour. You shall do well in it. How is it, worthy Antonio? But, sir, I am to have a private conference with you about a scandalous report is spread touching mine honour. Let me be ever deaf to it. One of Pascal's paper bullets, court calumny, a pestilent air which princes' palaces are seldom purged of. Yet, say that it were true, I'd pour it in your bosom. My fixed love would strongly excuse, extenuate, nay, deny faults were they apparent in you. Go, be safe in your own innocency. Oh, blessed comfort! This deadly air is purged. Come all! Her guilt treads on hot burning coulters. Now, Bossala, how thrives our intelligence? Sir, I'm certainly. It is rumoured she hath had three bastards, but by whom we may go read of the stars. <laughs> Why, some held opinion all things are written there. Yes, if we could find spectacles to read them. I do suspect there hath been some sorcery used on the Duchess. Sorcery? To what purpose? To make her dote on some desertless fellow she shames to acknowledge. Can your faith give way to think there's power in potions or in charms to make us love whether we will or no? Most certainly. <laughs> away! These are mere galleries, horrid things, invented by some cheating mountebanks to abuse us. <laughs> Do you think that herbs or charms can force the will? The witchcraft lies in her rank blood. This night... I will force confession from her. You told me you had got, within these two days, a false key into her bedchamber. I have. As I would wish. What do you intend to do? Can you guess? No. Do not ask, then. He that can compass me, and know my drifts, may say he hath put a girdle about the world, and sounded all her quicksands. I do not think so. What do you think, then, pray? That you are your own chronicle too much, and grossly flatter yourself. <laughs> Give me thy hand, I thank thee. <laughs> I never gave pension but to flatterers till I entertain thee. Farewell. the casket and the glass, Cariola. Mm. You get no lodging here tonight, my lord. Indeed, I must persuade one. <laughs> Very good. <laughs> I hope in time to grow into a custom that noblemen shall come with cap and knee to purchase a night's lodging of their wives. Oh. <laughs> I must lie here. Must? You are a lord of misrule. Indeed, my rule is only in the night. To what use will you put me? Uh, we'll sleep together. Alas! <laughs> what pleasure can two lovers find in sleep? My lord, I lie with her often, and I know she'll much disquiet me. <laughs> See? You're complained of. For she's the sprawlingest bedfellow. <laughs> I shall like her the better for that. Sir, shall I ask you a question? I pray thee, Cariola. Wherefore still, when you lie with my lady, do you rise so early? Ah, labouring men count the clock oftenest, Cariola, are glad when their tasks ended. <laughs> oh, stop your mouth! <sighs> Nay, that's but one. Venus had two soft doves to draw her chariot. I must have another. <laughs> Mm. 
When wilt thou marry, Cariola? Never, my lord. Oh, <laughs> fie upon this single life. Forgo it. We read how Daphne, for her peevish flight, became a fruitless bay tree. Syrinx turned to the pale, empty reed. And Axarete was frozen into marble. Whereas those which married, or proved kind unto their friends were by a gracious influence transshaped into the olive <laughs> pomegranate mulberry became flowers precious stones or eminent stars this is a vain poetry but i pray you tell me if there were proposed me wisdom riches and beauty in three several young men which should i choose mm, it is a hard question this was paris case and he was blind in it, and there was a great cause, for how was it possible he could judge right, having three amorous goddesses in view, and they stark naked? <laughs> <laughs> it was a motion were able to benight the apprehension of the severest counsellor of Europe. Now I look on both your faces so well formed, it puts me in mind of a question I would ask. What is it? I do wonder why hard-favoured ladies, for the most part, keep worse-favoured waiting women to attend them, and cannot endure fair ones. <laughs> oh, that's soon answered. Did you ever in your life know an ill painter desire to have his dwelling next door to the shop of an excellent picture-maker, to disgrace his face-making and undo him? <laughs> I prithee, when were we so merry? <laughs> Oh, my head tangles. Pray thee, Cariola, let's steal forth the room and let her talk to herself. <laughs> I have diverse times served her the like when she hath chafed extremely. I love to see her angry softly, mm. Cariola. Mm. Mm. Doth not the colour of my hair begin to change? When I wax grey, I shall have all the court powder their hair with arras to be like me. <laughs> She is alone. I hear her confession. You have cause to love me. I entered you into my heart before you would vouchsafe to call for the keys. We shall one day have my brothers take you napping. Methinks his presence, being now in court, should make you keep your own bed. But you'll say... Love mixed with fear is sweetest. Hm. I assure you, you shall get no more children to my brother's consent to be your gossips. <laughs> Have you lost your tongue? Ferdinand. Sister. Tis welcome. For know, whether I am doomed to live or die, I can do both like a prince. Die then, quickly. Virtue, where art thou hid? What hideous thing is it that doth eclipse thee? Pray, sir, hear me. Or is it true thou art but a bare name and no essential thing? Sir. Do not speak. No, sir. I will plant my soul in mine ears to hear you. Ah! Most imperfect light of human reason that makes us so unhappy to foresee what we can least prevent. Pursue thy wishes and glory in them. There's in shame no comfort but to be past all bounds and sense of shame. I pray, sir, hear me. I am married. So? Happily not to your liking, but for that, alas, your shears do come untimely now to clip the bird's wing that's already flown. Will you see my husband? <laughs> yes, if I could change eyes with a basilisk. Sure, you came hither by his confederacy. The howling of a wolf is music to thee, screech owl, pretty peace. Whatever thou art that hast enjoyed my sister, for I am sure thou hearest me, for thine own sake let me not know thee. I came hither prepared to work thy discovery, yet I'm now persuaded it would beget such violent effects as would damn us both. I would not, for ten millions I had beheld thee. Therefore, use all means. I never may have knowledge of thy name. Enjoy thy lust still, and a wretched life on that condition. 
And for thee, vile woman, if thou do wish thy lecher may grow old in thy embracements, I would have thee build such a room for him as our anchorites to holier use inhabit. Let not the sun shine on him till he's dead. Let dogs and monkeys only converse with him, and such dumb things to whom nature denies use to sound his name. Do not keep a parakeeto, lest she learn it. If thou do love him, cut out thine own tongue, lest it bewray him. Why might not I marry? I've not gone about in this to create any new world or custom. Thou art undone! And thou hast taken that massy sheet of lead that hid thy husband's bones and folded it about my heart! Mine bleeds for it. Thine! Thy heart! What should I name it unless a hollow bullet filled with unquenchable wild fire? You are in this too strict. And were you not my princely brother, I would say too willful. My reputation is safe. Dost thou know what reputation is? I'll tell thee, to small purpose, since the instruction comes not too late. Upon a time, reputation, love and death would travel over the world, and it was concluded that they should part and take three several ways. Death told them they should find him in great battles or cities plagued with plagues. Love gives them counsel to inquire for him amongst unambitious shepherds where dowries were not talked of and sometimes amongst quiet kindred that had nothing left by their dead parents. Stay, quoth reputation. Do not forsake me, for it is my nature. If once I part from any man I meet, I am never found again. And so for you, you have shook hands with reputation and made him invisible. So fare you well. I will never see you more. Why should only I, of all the other princes of the world, be cased up like a holy relic? I have youth and a little beauty. So you have some virgins that are witches. I will never see thee more! You saw this apparition? Yes, we are betrayed. How came he hither? I should turn this pistol to thee for that. Pray, sir, do. And when that you have cleft my heart, you shall read there mine innocence. That gallery gave him entrance. Oh, but this terrible thing would come again, that standing on my guard I might relate my warrantable love. What means this poniard? He left this with me. And it seems did wish you would use it on yourself. His actions seem to intend so much. This hath a handle to it as well as a point. Turn it towards him and so fasten the keen edge in his rank gall. How now, who knocks? More earthquakes. I stand as if a mine beneath my feet were ready to be blown up. Tis Bosola. Antonio, away. Hmm? Oh, misery. Methinks unjust action should wear these masks and curtains, and not we. You must instantly part hence. Uh, I have fashioned it already. The Duke, your brother, is ta'en up in a whirlwind, hath took horse and's rid post to Rome. So late? He told me as he mounted into the saddle, you were undone. Indeed. I am very near it. What's the matter? Antonio, the master of our household, hath dealt so falsely with me in's accounts. My brother stood engaged with me for money, ta'en up of certain Neapolitan Jews, and Antonio lets the bonds be forfeit. Strange. This is cunning. And hereupon, my brother's bills at Naples are protested against. Call up our officers. I shall. Antonio, the place that you must fly to is Ancona. Mm -hmm. Hire a house there. I'll send after you my treasure and my jewels. Our weak safety runs upon enginous wheels. Short syllables must stand for periods. I must now accuse you of such a feigned crime as Tasso calls magnanima menzogna, a noble lie, because it must shield our honours. Hark! They're coming. Will your grace hear me? I have got well by you. You have yielded me a million of loss. I am like to inherit the people's curses for your stewardship. You had the trick in audit time to be sick, 
till I had signed your quietus, and that cured you without help of a doctor. Gentlemen, I would have this man be an example to you all. So shall you hold my favour, I pray. Let him. For has done that, alas, you would not think of. And because I intend to be rid of him, I mean not to publish. Use your fortune elsewhere. I am strongly armed to brook my overthrow, as commonly men bear with a hard year. I will not blame the cause on't, but who think the necessity of my malevolent star procures this, not her humour. Oh, the inconstant and rotten ground of service. You may see it is even like him that in a winter night takes a long slumber o'er a dying fire, loath to part from it, yet parts thence as cold as when he first sat down. We do confiscate towards the satisfying of your accounts all that you have. I am all yours, and tis very fit all mine should be so. So, sir, you have your pass. You may see, gentlemen, what tis to serve a prince with body and soul. Here's an example for extortion. What moisture is drawn out of the sea when foul weather comes, pours down and runs into the sea again. Alas, poor gentlemen. Poor? He hath amply filled his coffers. Sure, he was too honest. Pluto, the god of riches, when he's sent by Jupiter to any man, he goes limping to signify that wealth that comes on God's name comes slowly. But when he's sent on the devil's errand, he rides post and comes in by scuttles. Let me show you what a most unvalued jewel you have in a wanton humour thrown away. To bless the man shall find him. He was an excellent courtier and most faithful, a soldier that thought it as beastly to know his own value too little as devilish to acknowledge it too much. Both his virtue and form deserved a far better fortune. His discourse rather delighted to judge itself than show itself. His breast was filled with all perfection, and yet it seemed a private whispering room it made so little noise of. But he was basely descended. Will you make yourself a mercenary herald rather to examine men's pedigrees than virtues? You shall want him. For no, an honest statesman to a prince is like a cedar planted by a spring. The spring bathes the tree's root. The grateful tree rewards it with his shadow. You have not done so. I would sooner swim to the Bermudas on two politicians' rotten bladders tied together with an intelligence's heartstring than depend on so changeable a prince's favour. Fare thee well, Antonia. Since the malice of the world would needs down with thee, it cannot be said yet that any ill happened unto thee, considering thy fall was accompanied with virtue. Oh, you render me excellent music. Say you. This good one that you speak of is my husband. Do I not dream? Can this ambitious age have so much goodness in as to prefer a man merely for worth? Without these shadows of wealth and painted honours, possible. I have had three children by him. Fortunate lady, for you have made your private nuptial bed the humble and fair seminary of peace. No question but. Many an unbeneficed scholar shall pray for you for this deed, and rejoice that some preferment in the world can yet arise from merit. The neglected poets of your time in honour of this trophy of a man, raised by that curious engine, your white hand, shall thank you in your grave for it, and make that more reverend than all the cabinets of living princes. As I taste comfort in this friendly speech, so would I find concealment. Oh, the, the secret of my prince, which I will wear on the inside of my heart. You shall take charge of all my coin and jewels, and follow him, for he retires himself to Ancona. So? Whither within few days I mean to follow thee. Let me think. Um, I would wish your grace to feign a pilgrimage to Our Lady of Loretto, scarce seven leagues from fair Ancona. So may you depart your country with more honour, and your flight will seem a princely progress, retaining your usual train about you. Sir, 
Your direction shall lead me by the hand. In my opinion, she would better progress to the baths at Luca, or go visit the spa in Germany. For, if you will believe me, I do not like this jesting with religion, this feigned pilgrimage. Oh, thou art a superstitious fool. <laughs> Prepare us instantly for our departure. Past sorrows, let us moderately lament them. For those to come, seek wisely to prevent them. A politician is the devil's quilted anvil. He fashions all sins on him, and the blows are never heard. He may work in a lady's chamber, as here, for proof. What rests but I reveal all to my lord? Ah, oh, this base quality of intelligence, sir. Why, every quality in the world prefers but gain or commendation. Now for this act I'm certain to be raised, and men that paint weeds to the life are praised. Doth she make religion her riding hood to keep her from the sun and tempest? That, that damns her. <laughs> Methinks her fault and beauty blended together shall like leprosy, the whiter the fouler. I make it a question whether her beggarly brats were ever christened. I will instantly solicit the state of Ancona to have them banished. You are for Loretta. Oh. All right. Fare you well. Antonio. A slave that only smelled of ink and counters, and never in his life looked like a gentleman but in the audit time. Go. Go presently. Draw me out a hundred fifty of our horse and meet me at the footbridge. Here's a strange turn of state. Who would have thought so great a lady would have matched herself unto so mean a person? Yet the cardinal bears himself much too cruel. They are banished. But I would ask, what power hath this state of Ancona to determine of a free prince? They are free states, sir. And her brother showed how that the Pope, for hearing of her looseness, hath seized into the protection of the church the dukedom which she held as dowager. But by what justice? Sure, I think by none. Only her brother's instigation. What was it with such violence he took off from her finger? Twas her wedding ring, which he vowed shortly he would sacrifice to his revenge. Alas, Antonio. If that a man be thrust into a well, no matter who sets hand to it, his own weight will bring him sooner to the bottom. Come, let's hence. Banished Ancona. Yes. You see what power lightens in great men's breath. Is all our train shrunk to this poor remainder? These poor men which have got little in your service vow to take your fortune, but your wiser buntings, now they are fledged, are gone. The birds that live in the field, on the wild benefit of nature, live happier than we, for they may choose their mates and carol their sweet pleasures to the spring. You are happily our tame. From my brother? Yes, from the Lord Ferdinand, your brother, all love and safety. Thou dost blanch mischief, wouldst make it white. See, see, like the calm weather at sea before a tempest. False hearts speak fair to those they intend most mischief. Send Antonio to me. I want his head in a business. A politic equivocation. He doth not want your counsel, but your head. That is, he cannot sleep till you be dead. And here's another pitfall that's strewed her with roses. Mark it, it's a cunning one. I stand engaged for your husband for several debts at Naples. Let not that trouble him. I had rather have his heart than his money. And I believe so too. What do you believe? That he so much distrusts my husband's love, he will by no means believe his heart is with him until he sees it. The devil is not cunning enough to circumvent us in riddles. Will you reject that noble and free league of amity and love which I present you? Oh. Their league is like that of some politic kings, only to make themselves of strength and power to be our after-ruin. Tell them so. Hmm. And what from you? Thus tell him I will not come. And what of this? My brothers have dispersed bloodhounds abroad. 
which till I hear are muzzled, no truce, though hatched with ne'er such politic skill is safe, that hangs upon our enemy's will. I'll not come at them. This proclaims your breeding. Every small thing draws a base mind to fear, as the adamant draws iron. Fare you well, sir. You shall shortly hear from us. I suspect some ambush. Therefore, by all my love, I do conjure you to take your eldest son and fly towards Millen. Let us not venture all this poor remainder in one unlucky bottom. Yeah, you cancel safely. Best of my life, farewell. Since we must part, heaven hath a hand in't. But no otherwise than as some curious artist takes in sunder a clock or watch when it is out of frame to bring it in better order. I know not which is best, to see you dead or part with you. Farewell, boy. Thou art happy that thou hast not understanding to know thy misery, for all our wit and reading brings us to a truer sense of sorrow. In the eternal church, sir, I do hope we shall not part thus. Oh, be of comfort. Make patience a noble fortitude, and think not how unkindly we are used. Man, like to Cassia, is proved best being bruised. Must I, like to a slave-born Russian, account it praise to suffer tyranny? And yet, oh God, thy heavy hand is in't. I have seen my little boy off scourge his top, and compared myself to it. Nought made me e'er go right. But heaven scourged it. Oh, do not weep. God fashioned us of nothing, and we strive to bring ourselves to nothing. Farewell, Cariola, and thy sweet armful. If I do never see thee more, be a good mother to your little ones and save them from the tiger. Fare you well. Let me look upon you once more. For that speech came from a dying father. Your kiss is colder than that I have seen an holy anchorite give to a dead man's skull. My heart is turned to a heavy lump of lead, which may sound my danger. Give me my son. Fare you well. My laurel is all withered. Look, madam, what a troop of armed men make towards us. Oh, they are very welcome. When fortune's will is overcharged with princes, the weight makes it move swift. I would have my ruin be sudden. I am your adventure. Am I not? You are. You must see your husband no more. What devil art thou that counterfeits heaven's thunder? Is that terrible? I would have you tell me whether is that note worse that frights the silly birds out of the corn, or that which doth allure them to the nets. You have hearkened to the last too much. Oh, misery! Like to a rusty o'ercharged cannon, shall I never fly in pieces? Come! To what prison? To none. I have heard that Charon's boat served to convey all o'er the dismal lake, but brings none back again. Your brothers mean you safety and pity. Pity? With such a pity, men preserve alive pheasants and quails when they're not fat enough to be eaten. These are your children? Yes. And they prattle? No. But I intend, since they were born accursed, curses shall be their first language. Fie, madam. Forget this base, low fellow. Were I a man, I'd beat that counterfeit face into thy other. One of no birth. Say he was born mean. Man is most happy when his own actions be arguments and examples of his virtue. A barren, beggarly virtue. I prithee, who is greatest? Can you tell? But come, whither you please, I am armed against misery, bent to all sways of the oppressor's will. There's no deep valley, but near some great hill. How did our sister Duchess bear herself in her imprisonment? Nobly. 
I'll describe her. She's sad as one long used to it, and she seems rather to welcome the end of misery than shun it. A behaviour so noble as gives a majesty to adversity. You may discern the shape of loveliness more perfect in her tears than in her smiles. She will muse for hours together, and her silence, methinks, expresseth more than if she spake. Her melancholy seems to be fortified with a strange disdain. Tis so, and this restraint, like English mastiffs that grow fierce with tying, makes her too passionately apprehend those pleasures she has kept from. Curse upon her! I will no longer study in the book of another's heart. Inform her what I told you. Or comfort to your grace. I will have none. Pray thee, why dost thou wrap thy poisoned pills in gold and sugar? Your elder brother, the Lord Ferdinand, is come to visit you, and sends you word, cause once he rashly made a solemn vow never to see you more. He comes i' the night, and prays you gently, neither torch nor taper shine in your chamber. He will kiss your hand, and reconcile himself, but for his vow he dares not see you. At his pleasure. Take hence the lights. <sighs> He's come. Where are you? Yes, sir. This darkness suits you well. I would ask you pardon. You have it. For I account it the honourablest revenge where I may kill to pardon. Where are your cubs? Whom? Call them your children. For though our national law distinguished bastards from true legitimate issue, compassionate nature makes them all equal. Do you visit me for this? You violate a sacrament of the church, shall make you howl in hell for it. It had been well, could you have lived thus always, for indeed, you were too much i' the light, but no more. I come to seal my peace with you. Here's a hand, to which you have vowed much love, the ring upon you gave. I affectionately kiss it. <laughs> Pray do, and bury the print of it in your heart. I will leave this ring with you for a love token, and the hand as sure as the ring, and do not doubt, but you shall have the heart too. When you need a friend, send it to him that owed it. You shall see whether he can aid you. You are very cold. I fear you are not well after your travel. <gasps> lights! Oh! Horrible! Let her have lights enough. What witchcraft doth he practice that he had left a dead man's hand here? This horror is too cruel. Yet I am bound to him. I must dissemble more, that she knows not my pity. Look you, here's the piece from which twas ta'en. He doth present you this sad spectacle, your husband and your children here displayed, that now you know directly they are dead. Hereafter you may wisely cease to grieve for that which cannot be recovered. There is not between heaven and earth one wish I stay for after this. It wastes me more than were it my picture, fashioned out of wax, stuck with a magical needle, and then buried in some foul dunghill. And yon's an excellent property for a tyrant, which I would account mercy. What's that? If they would bind me to that lifeless trunk, and let me freeze to death. Come, you must live. That's the greatest torture souls feel in hell. In hell, that they must live and cannot die. Pa! 
Master. I'll new kindle my coals again and revive the rare and almost dead example of a loving wife. Oh, fie, despair. Remember, you are a Christian. The church enjoins fasting. I'll starve myself to death. Leave this vain sorrow. Things being at the worst begin to mend. The bee, when he hath shot his sting into your hand, may then play with your eyelid. Good, comfortable fellow. Persuade a wretch that broke upon the wheel to have all his bones new set. Entreat him to live, to be executed again. Who must dispatch me? I account this world a tedious theatre, for I do play a part in against my will. Come, be of comfort. I will save your life. Indeed, I have not leisure to tend so small a business. Now, by my life, I pity you. What a fool, then, to waste thy pity on a thing so wretched as cannot pity itself. <laughs> I am full of daggers. <laughs> Let me blow these vapours from me! I shall shortly grow one of the miracles of pity. I'll go pray. No! I'll go curse! Oh, fie. I could curse the stars! Oh, fearful. And those three smiling seasons of the year into a Russian winter, nay, the world to its first chaos! Look you, the stars shine still. Oh, but you must remember, my curse hath a great way to go. Plagues that make lanes through largest families. Consume them! Hi, lady. Let them, like tyrants, never be remembered but for the ill they have done. Let all the zealous prayers of mortified churchmen forget them. Oh, uncharitable. Let heaven a little while cease crowning martyrs to punish them. Go, howl them this and say, I long to bleed. It is some mercy when men kill with speed. <laughs> Excellent, Bossela. As I would wish, she's plagued in art. <laughs> These presentations are but framed in wax by the curious master in that quality, Vincenzo Lariola, and she takes them for true substantial bodies. Why do you do this? <laughs> to bring her to despair. Faith, end here. And go no farther in your cruelty. Send her a penitential garment to put on, next to her delicate skin, and furnish her with beads and prayer books. Damn her! That body of hers! While that my blood run purent was more worth than that which thou wouldst comfort called a soul. <laughs> I will send her masks of common courtesans, have her meat served up by boards and ruffians, and because she'll needs be mad, I am resolved to move forth the common hospital, all the mad folk, and place them near her lodging. There let them practice together, sing and dance, and act their gambols to the full of the moon. If she can sleep the better for it, let her. Your work is almost ended. But must I see her again? Yes. Never. You must. Never in mine own shape. That's forfeited by my intelligence and this last cruel lie. When you send me next, the business shall be comfort. Very likely. Thy pity is nothing of kin to thee. Antonio lurks about Milan. Thou shalt shortly thither to feed a fire as great as my revenge, which never will slack till it hath spent its fuel. Intemperate agues make physicians cruel. What hideous noise was that? Tis a wild consort of madmen, lady which your tyrant brother have placed about your lodging. This tyranny, I think, was never practised till this hour. Indeed, I thank him. Nothing but noise and folly can keep me in my right wits, whereas reason and silence make me stark mad. Sit down. Discourse to me some dismal tragedy. Oh, it will increase your melancholy. Thou art deceived. To hear of greater grief would lessen mine. This is a prison. Yes, but you shall live to shake this durance off. 
Thou art a fool. The robin redbreast and the nightingale never live long in cages. Pray dry your eyes. What think you of, madam? Of nothing. When I muse thus, I sleep. Like a madman, with your eyes open? Dost thou think we shall know one another in the other world? Yes, out of question. Oh, that it were possible we might but hold some two days' conference with the dead. From then, I should learn some what I am sure I never shall know here. I'll tell thee a miracle. I am not mad yet to my cause of sorrow. The heaven, o'er、oh、my head, seems made of molten brass, the earth of flaming sulphur, yet I am not mad. I am acquainted with sad misery as the tanned galley slave is with his oar. Necessity makes me suffer constantly, and custom makes it easy. Who do I look like now? Like to your picture in the gallery. A deal of life in show, but none in practice. Or rather, like some reverend monument whose ruins are even pitied. Very proper. And fortune seems only to have her eyesight to behold my tragedy. How now? What noise is that? I am come to make thy tomb. <laughs> my tomb? Thou speaks as if I lay upon my deathbed gasping for breath. Dost thou perceive me sick? Yes. And the more dangerously, since thy sickness is insensible. Thou art not mad, sure. Dost know me? Yes. Who am I? Thou art a box of worm seed, at best but a salvatory of green mummy. What's this flesh? A little crudded milk, fantastical puff paste. Our bodies are weaker than those paper prisons boys used to keep flies in. More contemptible, since ours is to preserve earthworms. Didst thou ever see a lark in a cage? Such is the soul in the body. This world is like her little turf of grass, and the heaven o'er our heads like her looking glass. Only gives us miserable knowledge of the small compass of our prison. Am not I thy duchess? Well, thou, thou art some great woman, sure. For riot begins to sit on thy forehead, clad in grey hairs, twenty years sooner than on a merry milkmaid. Thou sleepest worse than if a mouse should be forced to take up her lodging at a cat's ear. A little infant that breeds its teeth, should it lie with thee, would cry out as if thou wert the more unquiet bedfellow. I am Duchess of Malfi still.、Mm, that makes thy sleep so broken. Glories like glowworms afar off shine bright, but looked too near have neither heat nor light. Thou art very plain. My trade is to flatter the dead, not the living. I am a tomb maker. And thou comest to make my tomb? Yes. Let me be a little merry. Of what stuff wilt thou make it? Nay, resolve me first. Of what fashion? Why? Do we grow fantastical on our deathbed? Do we affect fashion in the grave? Most ambitiously. Princes' images on their tombs do not lie as they were wont, seeming to pray up to heaven. But with their hands under their cheeks, as if they died of the toothache, they are not carved with their eyes fixed upon the stars. But as their minds were wholly bent upon the world, the selfsame way they seem to turn their faces. Let me know fully, therefore, the effect of this thy dismal preparation, this talk fit for a charnel. Now I shall. This coffin's a present from your princely brothers. And may it arrive welcome, for it brings last benefit, last sorrow. Let me see it. I have so much obedience in my blood. I wish it in their veins to do them good. This is your last presence chamber. Oh, my sweet lady! Peace. It affrights not me. I am the common bellman that usually is sent to condemned persons the night before they suffer. Even now. Thou saidst thou wast a tomb maker.、Uh, Twas to bring you by degrees to mortification. Hence, villains, tyrants, murderers! Alas, what will you do with my lady? Call for help to whom? To our next neighbours. They are mad folk. Remove that noise. <laughs> no. Farewell, Cariola. In my last will, I have not much to give, and many hungry guests have fed upon me. Thine will be a poor aversion. I will die with her. No. I pray thee, 
Look thou gives my little boy some syrup for his cold, and let the girl say her prayers ere she sleep. Now, what do you please? What death? Strangling. Here are your executioners. I forgive them. The apoplexy, catarrh, or cough of the lungs would do as much as they do. Doth not death fright you? Who would be afraid on't? knowing to meet such excellent company in the other world. Yet methinks the manner of your death should much afflict you. This cord should terrify you. Not a whit. What? Would it pleasure me to have my throat cut with diamonds, or to be smothered with cassia, or to be shot to death with pearls? I know death hath ten thousand several doors for men to take their exits, and tis found they go on such strange geometrical hinges you may open them both ways. Any way, for heaven's sake, so I were out of your whispering. Tell my brothers that I perceive death, now I am well awake. Best gift is they can give or I can take. I would fain put off my last woman's fault. I'd not be tedious to you. We're ready. Dispose my breath how please you, but my body... Bestow upon my woman, will you? Yes. Pull, and pull strongly, for your able strength must pull down heaven upon me. Yet stay. Heaven gates are not so highly arched as princes' palaces. They that enter there must go upon their knees. Come, violent death, serve for Mandragora to make me sleep. Go tell my brothers, when I am laid out, they then may feed in quiet. the waiting woman fetch her. I shall. Some other strangle the children. Look you, there sleeps your mistress. Oh, you are damned perpetually for this. My turn is next. Is it not so ordered? Yes, and I am glad you are so well prepared for it. You are deceived, sir. I am not prepared for it. I will not die. I will first come to my answer and know how I have offended. Come, dispatcher. You kept her counsel, now you shall keep ours. I will not die, I must not. I am contracted to a young gentleman. Here's your wedding ring. Let me but speak with the Duke. I'll discover treason to his person. Delays throttler. <laughs> she bites and scratches. If you kill me now, I am damned. I have not been at confession this two years. When? I am quick with child. Why well, then your credit's saved. <laughs> <laughs> Bear her into the next room. Let this lie still. Is she dead? She is what you'd have her. But here begin your pity. Alas, how have the children offended? <laughs> the death of young wolves is never to be pitied. Fix your eye here. Constantly. Do you not weep? Other sins only speak. Murder shrieks out. The element of water moistens the earth, but blood flies upwards and bedews the heavens. I'll cover her face. My eyes dazzle. She died young. I think not so. Her infelicity seemed to have years too many. She and I were twins. And should I die this instant, I had lived her time to a minute. It seems she was born first. You have bloodily approved the ancient truth that kindred commonly do worse agree than remote strangers. Let me see her face again. Why didst thou not pity her? What an excellent, honest man mightst thou have been if thou hadst borne her to some sanctuary, or, bold in a good cause, opposed thyself with thy advanced sword above thy head between her innocence and my revenge. I bade thee, when I was distracted of my wits, go kill my dearest friend, and thou hast done it. 
for let me but examine well the cause. What was the meanness of her match to me? Only, I must confess, I had a hope, had she continued widow, to have gained an infinite mass of treasure by her death. And that was the main cause. Her marriage that drew a stream of gall quite through my heart. For thee, as we observe in tragedies, that a good actor many times is cursed for playing a villain's part, I hate thee for it, and for my sake say, thou hast done much ill well. Let me quicken your memory, for I perceive you are falling into ingratitude. I challenge the reward due to my service. I'll tell thee what I'll give thee. Do. I'll give thee a pardon for this murder. Ha! Huh? Yes, and it is the largest bounty I can study to do thee. By what authority didst thou execute this bloody sentence? By yours. Mine? Was I her judge? Did any ceremonial form of law doom her to not being? Did a complete jury deliver her conviction up at court? Where shalt thou find this judgment registered, unless in hell? See, like a bloody fool, thou hast forfeited thy life, and thou shalt die for it. The office of justice is perverted quite when one thief hangs another. Who shall dare to reveal this? Oh, I'll tell thee. The wolf shall find her grave and scrape it up. Not to devour the corpse, but to discover the horrid murder. You, not I, shall quake for it. Believe me! I will first receive my pension. You are a villain! When your ingratitude is judge, I am so. Oh, horror! That not the fear of him which binds the devils can prescribe man obedience. Never look upon me more! Why, oh, fare thee well. Your brother and yourself are worthy men. You have a pair of hearts of hollow graves, rotten and rotting others, and your vengeance, like two chained bullets, still goes arm in arm. You may be, brothers, for treason, like the plague, doth take much in a blood. I stand like one that long hath ta'en a sweet and golden dream. I'm angry with myself now that I wake. Get thee into some unknown part of the world, that I may never see thee. Let me know wherefore I should be thus neglected, sir. I served your tyranny, and rather strove to satisfy yourself than all the world. And though I loathed the evil, yet I loved you that did counsel it, and rather sought to appear a true servant than an honest man. I'll go hunt the badger by our light. Tis a deed of darkness! He's much distracted. Off my painted honour! While with vain hopes our faculties we tire, we seem to sweat in ice and freeze in fire. What would I do were this to do again? I would not change my peace of conscience for all the wealth of Europe. <gasps> she stirs. He is life. Return, fair soul, from darkness, and lead mine out of this sensible hell. She's warm, she breathes. Upon thy pale lips I will melt my heart to store them with fresh colour. Who's there? Some cordial drink? Alas, I dare not call. So pity would destroy pity. Her eye hopes, and heaven in it seems to ope that late was shut, to take me up to mercy. Antonia. Yes, madam, he is living. The dead bodies you saw were but feigned statues. He's reconciled to your brothers. The Pope hath wrought the atonement. Mercy. She's gone again. There the cords of life broke. O oh, sacred innocence, that sweetly sleeps on turtle's feathers, whilst a guilty conscience is a black register wherein is writ all our good deeds and bad, a perspective that shows us hell, <laughs> that we cannot be suffered to do good when we have a mind to it. This is madly sorrow. These tears, I'm very certain, never grew in my mother's milk. My estate is sunk below the degree of fear. Where were these penitent fountains while she was living? Oh, they were frozen up. Here is a sight as direful to my soul as is the sword unto a wretch hath slain his father. Come, I'll bear thee hence, and execute thy last will. That's deliver thy body to the reverend dispose of some good women. That the cruel tyrant shall not deny me. Then I'll post to Milan, where somewhat I will speedily enact worth my dejection.
What think you of my hope of reconcilement to the Aragonian brethren? I misdoubt it. For though they have sent their letters of safe conduct, they appear but nets to entrap you. The Marquis of Pescara, under whom you hold certain land in cheat, much against his noble nature hath been moved to seize those lands, and some of his dependents are at this instant making it their suit to be invested in your revenues. I, I cannot think they mean well to your life that do deprive you of your means of life, your living. Oh, you're still an heretic to any safety I can shape myself. Oh, here comes the Marquis. Sir! Prince Ferdinand's come to Milan, sick as they give out of an apoplexy, but some say it is a frenzy. I am going to visit him. Tis a noble old fellow. What course do you mean to take, Antonio? This night I mean to venture all my fortune, which is no more than a poor lingering life, to the Cardinal's worst of malice. I've got private access to his chamber, and intend to visit him about the mid of night, as once his brother did our noble Duchess. It may be that the sudden apprehension of danger, for I'll go in mine own shape when he shall see it, fraught with love and duty, may draw the poison out of him and work a friendly reconcilement. If it fail, yet it shall rid me of this infamous calling, for better fall once than be ever falling. I'll second you in all danger, and howe'er my life keeps rank with yours. Oh, you are still my loved and best friend. Now, Doctor, may I visit your patient? If it please your lordship. But he's instantly to take the air here in the gallery, by my direction. Pray thee, what's his disease? A very pestilent disease, my lord. They call lycanthropia. What's that? I need a dictionary to it. I'll tell you. In those that are possessed with it, there all flows such melancholy humour, they imagine themselves to be transformed into wolves, steal forth to churchyards in the dead of night, and dig dead bodies up. As two nights since, one met the Duke about midnight in a lane behind St. Mark's Church, with the leg of a man upon his shoulder, and he howled fearfully, said he was a wolf. Only the difference was... A wolf's skin was hairy on the outside, his on the inside. Bade them take their swords, rip up his flesh, and try. Straight I was sent for, and having ministered to him, found his grace very well recovered. I am glad on it. Yet not without some fear of a relapse. If he grow to his fit again, I'll go a nearer way to work with him that ever Paracelsus dreamt of. If they'll give me leave... I'll buffet his madness out of him. Oh, stand aside. He comes. Leave me! Why doth your lordship love this solitariness? Eagles commonly fly alone. They are crows, daws, and starlings that flock together. Look, what's that follows me? Nothing, my lord. Yes! Tis your shadow. Stay it! Let it not haunt me! Impossible if you move and the sun shine. I will throttle it! Oh, my, my lord, you are angry with nothing. You are a fool. How is it possible I should catch my shadow unless I fall upon it? When I go to hell, I mean to carry a bribe. For look, you good gifts evermore make way for the worst persons. Wise, good my lord. I am studying the art of patience. Tis a noble virtue. To drive six snails before me from this town to Moscow neither use gold nor whip to them but let them take their own time <laughs> the patience man in the world match me for an experiment and I'll crawl after like a sheep biter force him up <laughs> use me well you were best what I have done I have done I'll confess nothing. Uh, now let me come to him. Are you mad, my lord? Are you out of your princely wits? What's he? Your doctor. <laughs> let me have his beard sawed off and his eyebrows filed more civil. I must do mad tricks with him, for that's the only way on. 
I have brought your grace a salamander's skin to keep you from sunburning. I have cruel sore eyes. Oh, the white of a cockatrix's egg is present remedy. Shall let it be a new laid one. You were best. Hide me from him. Physicians are like kings. They brook no contradiction. Now he begins to fear me. Now let me alone with him. How now? Put off your gown. Let me have some forty urinals filled with rose water. He and I'll go pelt one another with them. Now he begins to fear me. Can you fetch a frisk, sir? Oh, let him go, let him go upon my peril. I find by his eye he stands in awe of me. I'll make him as tame as a dormouse. Can you fetch your frisk, sir? I will stamp him into a cullis, flay off his skin to cover one of the anatomies this rogue hath set it cold yonder in Barber Chirurgeon's Hall. Hands, hands, you are all of you like beasts for sacrifice. You stand aside, my lord. Oh! There's nothing left of you but tongue oh! and belly, oh! flattery and lechery. Doctor, he did not fear you thoroughly. True. I was somewhat too forward. Sir, I will speak with you. We'll leave your grace. Wishing to the sick prince, our noble lord, all health of mind and body. You are most welcome. Are you come? So, this Bosolo must not know by any means I had intelligence in our Duchess' death, for though I counselled it, the full of all the engagement seemed to grow from Ferdinand. Now, sir, how fares our sister? I do not think but sorrow makes her look like to an oft-dyed garment. She shall now take comfort from me. Why do you look so wildly? Oh, the fortune of your master here, the prince, dejects you. But be you of happy comfort. If you'll do one thing for me, I'll entreat. Though he had a cold tombstone o'er his bones, I'd make you what you would be. Anything. Give it me in a breath and let me fly to it. They that think long, small expedition win. For musing much of the end cannot begin. <laughs> Sir, will you come in to supper? I'm busy. Leave me. What an excellent shape hath that fellow. Tis thus. Antonio lurks here in Milan. Inquire him out and kill him. While he lives, our sister cannot marry, and I have thought of an excellent match for her. Do this, and style me thy advancement. But by what means shall I find him out? There is a gentleman called Delio here in the camp that hath been long approved his loyal friend. Set eye upon that fellow. Follow him to Mass. Maybe Antonio, although he do account religion but a school name, the fashion of the world may accompany him. Or else go inquire out Delio's confessor, and see if you can bribe him to reveal it. There are a thousand ways a man might find to trace him, as to know what fellows haunt the Jews for taking up great sums of money for sure he's in want, or else to go to the picture-makers and learn who bought her picture lately. Some of these happily may take. Well, I'll not freeze you the business. I would see that wretched thing Antonio above all sights of the world. Do, and be happy. This fellow doth breed basilisks in his eyes. He's nothing else but murder. Yet he seems not to have notice of the Duchess' death. Tis his cunning. I must follow his example. There cannot be a surer way to trace than that of an old fox. Julia. So, sir, you are well met. How now? Nay, the doors are fast enough. Now, sir, I will make you confess your treachery. Treachery? Yes. Confess to me which of my women twas you hired to put love powder into my drink. <laughs> love powder? Yes, when I was at Malfi. Why should I fall in love with such a face else? I have already suffered for thee so much pain. The only remedy to do me good is to kill my longing. Sure your pistol holds nothing but perfumes or kissing comforts. Excellent lady. You have a pretty way on to discover your longing. Come, come. I'll disarm you. Oh. Arm you thus. Yet this is wondrous strange. Oh, Unpair thy form and my eyes together. You'll find my love no such great miracle. 
<laughs> now you'll say I am wanting. This nice modesty in ladies is but a troublesome familiar that haunts them. Know you me? I am a blunt soldier. The better. Sure, there wants fire where there are no lively sparks of roughness. And I want compliment. Why, ignorance and courtship cannot make you do amiss, if you have heart to do well. You are very fair. Nay, if you lay beauty to my charge, I must plead unguilty. Your bright eyes carry a quiver of darts in them sharper than sunbeams. You will mar me with commendation. Put yourself to the charge of courting me, whereas now I woo you. <laughs> I have it. I will work upon this creature. Let us grow most amorously familiar. <laughs> the great cardinal now should see me thus. And do not count me a villain. No. Uh, he might count me a wanton. <laughs> oh, not lay a scruple of offence on you. For if I see and steal a diamond, the fault is not in the stone, but in me, the thief that purloins it. Ah, oh, ah. Oh. <laughs> I am sudden with you. We that are great women of pleasure used mm. to cut off these uncertain wishes and unquiet longings, mm. and in an instant join the sweet delight and the pretty excuse together. Oh. Had you been in the street under my chamber window... Oh. Even there I should have courted you. Oh, you are an excellent lady. Oh, bid me do somewhat for you presently, to express I love you. I will. And if you love me, fail not to affect it. The Cardinal is grown wondrous melancholy. Demand the cause. Let him not put you off with feigned excuse. Discover the main ground on it. Why would you know this? I have depended on him, and I hear that he has fallen in some disgrace with the Emperor. If he be, like the mice that forsake falling houses, I would shift to other dependents. You shall not need follow the wars. I'll be your maintenance. And I your loyal servant. <gasps> but I cannot leave my calling. Not leave an ungrateful general for the love of a sweet lady. You are like some cannot sleep in feather beds, but must have blocks for their pillows. Will you do this? Cunningly. Tomorrow I'll expect the intelligence. Tomorrow? Get you into my cabinet. You shall have it with you. Do not delay me no more than I do you. Mm. I am like one that is condemned. I have my pardon promised, but I would see it sealed. Mm. Oh. Oh. Go, get you in. You shall see me wind my tongue about his heart like a skein of silk. Your loyal servant, madam. Where are my men? Let none upon your lives have conference with the Prince Ferdinand unless I know it. In this distraction he may reveal the murder. Yon's my lingering consumption. I am weary of her, and by any means would be quit of. Come, Julia, sit. How oh, now, my lord? What ails you? Nothing. Oh, you are much altered. Come, I must be your secretary and remove this lead from off your bosom. What's the matter? I may not tell you. Are you so far in love with sorrow you cannot part with part of it? Oh, or think you I cannot love your grace when you are sad as well as merry? <laughs> <laughs> or do you suspect I, that have been a secret to your heart these many winters, cannot be the same unto your tongue? Satisfy thy longing. The only way to make thee keep my counsel is not to tell thee. Tell your echo this, or flatterers, that like echoes still report what they hear, though most imperfect... And not me. For if that you be true unto yourself, I'll know. Will you wreck me? No. Judgment shall draw it from you. It is an equal fault to tell one's secrets unto all or none. The first argues folly. But the last tyranny. <laughs> Very well. Why, well, imagine I have committed some secret deed which I desire the world may never hear of. Therefore may not I know it? 
You have concealed from me as great a sin as adultery. Sir, never was occasion for perfect trial of my constancy till now. Sir, I beseech you. You'll repent it. Never. It hurries thee to ruin. I'll not tell thee. Be well advised, and think what danger it is to receive a prince's secrets. They that do had need have their breasts hooped with adamant to contain them. I pray oh. thee, yet be satisfied. Examine thine own frailty. It is more easy to tie knots than unloose them. It is a secret that, like a lingering poison, may chance lie spread in thy veins and kill thee seven years hence. Now you dally with me. <laughs> <laughs> no more. Thou shalt know it. By my appointment, the great Duchess of Malfi and two of her young children four nights since were strangled. Oh, heaven! Sir, what have you done? How now? How settles this? Think of your bosom will be a grave, dark and obscure enough for such a secret. You have undone yourself, sir. Why? It lies not in me to conceal it. No? Come. I will swear you to it upon this book. Oh, most religiously. Kiss it. I... Now, you shall never utter it. Thy curiosity hath undone thee. Thou art poisoned with that book. Because I knew thou couldst not keep my counsel, I have bound thee to it by death. What is thy hold, huh? Basil? Oh, I, I forgive you this equal piece of justice you have done. For I betrayed your counsel to that fellow. He overheard it. Oh, that was the cause I said it lay not in me to conceal it. Oh, foolish woman! Couldst not thou have poisoned him? It is weakness. Too much to think what should have been done. I go. I know not whither. Wherefore comest thou hither? that I might find a great man like yourself, not out of his wits as the Lord Ferdinand, to remember my service. I'll have thee hewed in pieces. Make not yourself such a promise of that life which is not yours to dispose of. Who placed thee here? Her lust, as she intended. Very well. Now you know me for your fellow murderer. Huh. And wherefore should you lay fair marble colours upon your rotten purposes to me? unless you imitate some that do plot great treasons, and when they have done, go hide themselves in the grave of those who are actors in. No more. There is a fortune attends thee. <laughs> Shall I go sue to fortune any longer? It is the fool's pilgrimage. I have honours in store for thee. There are many ways that conduct to seeming honour, and some of them very dirty ones. Throw to the devil thy melancholy. The fire burns well. What need we keep a stirring of it and make a greater smother? Thou wilt kill Antonio? Yes. Take up that body. I think I shall shortly grow the common beer for churchyards. Come to me after midnight to help to remove that body to her own lodging. I'll give out she died of the plague for breathe the less inquiry after her death. There is the master key of our lodgings, and by that you may conceive what trust I plant in you. You shall find me ready. Oh, poor Antonio. Though nothing be so needful to thy estate as pity, yet I find nothing so dangerous. I must look to my footing. In such slippery ice pavements, men had need to be frost-nailed well. They may break their necks else. The precedence here afore me. How this man bears up in blood, seems fearless. Why, it is well. Security some men call the suburbs of hell. Only a dead wall between. Well, good Antonio, I'll seek thee out, and all my care shall be to put thee into safety from the reach of these most cruel biters that have got some of thy blood already. It may be I'll join with thee in a most just revenge. The weakest arm is strong enough that strikes with the sword of justice. Still, methinks the Duchess haunts me. There. There. It is nothing but my melancholy. Oh, penitence, let me truly taste thy cup.
that throws men down only to raise them up. storm tonight the lord ferdinand's chamber shook like an osier it was nothing but pure kindness in the devil to rock his own child you shall not watch tonight by the sick prince his grace is very well recovered good my lord suffer us oh by no means the noise and change of object in his eye doth more distract him i pray all to bed and though you hear him in his violent fit do not rise i entreat you so sir we shall not Nay, I must have you promise upon your honours, for I was enjoined to it by himself, and he seemed to urge it sensibly. Let our honours bind this trifle. Nor any of your followers? Neither. It may be to make trial of your promise when he's asleep, myself will rise and feign some of his mad tricks and cry out for help, and feign myself in danger. If your throat were cutting, I'd not come at you, now I have protested against it. Why, I thank you. Come. The reason why I would not suffer these about my brother is because at midnight I may with better privacy convey Julia's body to her own lodging. Oh, my conscience! I would pray now, but the devil takes away my heart for having any confidence in prayer. About this hour I appointed Bossler to fetch the body. When he'll serve my turn, he dies. was the Cardinal's voice. I heard him name Bossola and my death. Listen, I hear one's footing. Strangling is a very quiet death. What say to that? Whisper softly. Do you agree to it? So, it must be done in the dark. My brother the Cardinal would not for a thousand pounds the doctor should see it. My death is plotted. He is the consequence of murder. We value not desert nor Christian breath when we know black deeds must be cured with death. Who comes? Is he returned? Would I had light? Here, yes, stay, sir, and be confident, I pray. I'll fetch you a dark lantern. Could I take him at his prayers, though a hope of pardon? Full right, my sword! Ah! Ah! I'll not give thee so much leisure as to ah! pray. Oh! Oh, I'm gone! Ah, oh, thou hast ended a long suit in a minute. What art thou? A most wretched thing that only have thy benefit and death to appear myself. I'll have the lantern. Where are you, sir? Oh, very near my home. Bossola. Oh, misfortune. Smother thy pity, thou art dead else. Give me that lantern. Antonio. The man I would have saved above mine own life. We are merely the star's tennis balls, struck and banded which way please them. O oh, good Antonio, I'll whisper one thing in thy dying ear shall make thy heart break quickly. Thy fair duchess and two sweet children. Oh, thy very name's getting to that little life in me. Are murdered. Some men have wished to die at the hearing of sad tidings. I am glad that I shall do it in sadness. Oh, I would not now wish my wounds bound nor healed, for I have no use to put my life to. Oh, in all our quest of greatness, like wanton boys whose pastime is their care, we follow after bubbles blown in the air. Pleasure of life. What is it? Only the good hours of an ague, merely a preparative to rest to endure vexation. I do not ask the process of my death. Only commend me to Delia. Break hard. Ah, and let my son fly the courts of princes. Thou seems to have loved Antonio. I brought him hither to have reconciled him to the cardinal. I do not ask thee that. Take him up if thou tender thine own life, and bear him where the Lady Julia was wont to lodge. <coughs> oh, my fate moves swift. 
I have this cardinal in the forge already. Now I'll bring him to the hammer. Oh, direful misprision! I will not imitate things glorious no more than base. I'll be mine own example. On, on, and look thou represent for silence the thing thou bearest. I'm puzzled in a question about hell. He says, in hell there's one material fire, and yet it shall not burn all men alike. Lay him by. How tedious is a guilty conscience. When I look into the fish ponds in my garden, methinks I see a thing armed with a rake that seems to strike at me. <gasps> so, I am come. Thou lookst ghastly. There sits in thy face some great determination mixed with some fear. Thus it lightens into action. I am come to kill thee. <gasps> Help! Our guard! Thou art deceived. They are out of thy howling. Hold! And I will faithfully divide revenues with thee. Thy prayers and proffers are both unseasonable. Raise the watch! We are betrayed! I have confined your flight. I'll suffer your retreat to Julia's chamber. But no further. Help! We are betrayed! Help! We are betrayed! We are betrayed! Listen! My duke come for rescue! Fie upon his counterfeiting. Why, it is not the cardinal. Yes, yes, it is he. But I'll see him hang there, I'll go down to him. There's a plot upon me! I am assaulted! I am lost in this dark rescue! <coughs> he doth this pretty well. But it will not serve to laugh me out of mine honour. The storm set my throat! You would not bawl so loud, then. <laughs> <laughs> come, come, let's go to bed. He told us this much aforehand. He wished you should not come at him, but believe it, the accent of the voice sounds not in jest. I'll down to him, howsoever, and with engines force out the doors. Let's follow him aloof and note how the cardinal will laugh at him. <laughs> the guard! The guard! There's for your servant first. Because <gasps> he shall not unbarricade the door to let in rescue. What cause hast thou to pursue my life? Look there. Antonio? Slain by my hand unwittingly. Pray, and be sudden. When thou killedst thy sister, thou tookst from justice her most equal balance, and left her naught but her sword. Oh, mercy! Now it seems thy greatness was only outward, for thou falst faster of thyself than calamity can drive thee. I'll not waste longer time. Thou oh, hast hurt me. Again. Shall I die like a leveret, without any resistance? Help! 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 I am slain! The alarm! Give me a fresh horse! Rally the vaunt guard or the day is lost! Yield! Yield! I give you the honour of arms. Shake my sword over you. Will you yield? Help me! I'm your brother! The devil! My brother fight upon the adverse party! There flies your ransom! Ha! Oh! Justice! I suffer now for what hath former been. Sorrow has held the eldest child of sin. What? Who's there? Oh. <laughs> Thou hast me too. Now, you're brave fellows. Caesar's fortune was harder than Pompey's. Caesar died in the arms of prosperity, Pompey at the feet of disgrace. You both died in the field. Oh, the pain's nothing. Pain many times is taken away with the apprehension of greater, as the toothache with the sight of a barber that comes to pull it out. <laughs> There's philosophy for you. Now! Oh. My revenge is perfect. Sink, thou main cause of my undoing. The last part of my life hath done me best service. Ah. Give me some wet hay. I am broken-winded. I do account this world but a dog kennel. I will vault credit and affect high pleasures beyond death. He seems to come to himself now he's so near the bottom. My sister. Oh, my sister. There's the cause, aunt. <sighs> Whether we fall by ambition, blood, or lust, like Diamonds, we are cut with our own dust. 
Bossel, thou hast thy payment too. Yes, I hold my weary soul in my teeth. It is ready to part from me. I do glory that thou, which stoodst like a huge pyramid begun upon a large and ample base, shalt end in a little point. <laughs> Kind of nothing. Hello, my lord! Oh, sad A disaster! How comes this? Revenge for the Duchess of Malfi murdered by the Aragonian brethren. For Antonio, slain by this hand. For lustful Julia, poisoned by this man. And lastly, for myself. It was an actor in the main of all, much against mine own good nature. Yet at the end, neglected. How now, my lord? Look to my brother. He gave us these large wounds as we were struggling here in the rushes. And now I pray, let me be laid by and never thought of. Oh. How fatally it seems he did withstand his own rescue. Now, wretched thing of blood. How came Antonio by his death? In the mist, I know not how. Such a mistake as I've often seen in a play. Oh, I am gone. We are only like dead walls or vaulted graves that ruined yield no echo. Fare you well. It may be pain, but no harm to me to die in so good a quarrel. Ah! <laughs> This gloomy world, in what a shadow or deep pit of darkness doth womanish and fearful mankind live. Let worthy minds ne'er stagger in distrust to suffer death or shame for what is just. Mine is another voyage. The noble Delio, as I came to the palace, told me of Antonio's being here and showed me a pretty gentleman, his son and heir. Oh, Delio, you come too late. I heard so, and was armed for it ere I came. Let us make noble use of this great ruin, and join all our force to establish this young, hopeful gentleman in his mother's right. These wretched, Eminent things leave no more fame behind them than should one fall in a frost and leave his print in snow. As soon as the sun shines, it ever melts both form and matter. I have ever thought nature doth nothing so great for great men as when she's pleased to make them lords of truth. Integrity of life is fame's best friend, which nobly, beyond death, shall crown the end. In The Duchess of Malfi by John Webster, The Duchess was played by Sophie Ocanedo, Antonio by Rory Kinnear, Duke Ferdinand by Jonathan Slinger, The Cardinal by Oliver Senton, and Bossola by Bertie Carvel. Delio was played by Oliver Lesueur, The Doctor by Michael Griffiths, Cariola by Becky Hindley, Julia by Rachel Babbage, Pescara by Paul Panting, Rodrigo and the Executioner by Nicholas Gad, and Grisselin and the Servant by Francis Middleditch. Other parts were played by members of the cast. The music was composed and played by Arthur Carway Jenkins. The technical presentation was by Norman Goodman, and it was adapted and directed by Roy McMillan. Mm -hmm.